Yay, it worked. <laughs> Always nervous when you got to be the one that changes computers, right? Yeah. Um, uh, guys, uh, I'm uh, Chris McMurtry. Uh, most people know me as CMAC. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a startup here in Nashville called Dart. Um, honored to get to be here tonight to talk about the digital supply chain. As we can see, uh, there's an amazing uh, group of folks from artists to uh, producers, um, engineers, composers, uh, distributors that make up the digital supply chain. But the one aspect of the digital supply chain when it comes to content that must remain consistent and accurate, where there is no room for error at all if creators are to get paid, is metadata. This is especially true for music, and that's what we do. We make sure that the metadata is correct so that songwriters like Tom get paid, musicians like Dave get paid, so that producers like Garth are properly credited so that PROs like BMI avoid the frustration when trying to get songwriters paid. Accurate metadata is necessary for hitting street dates on time, if you're a manual. Metadata makes it so that you can find the music you're looking for in Spotify and other digital service providers. Without accurate metadata, there are no billboard charts. As you heard Dave describe, we're kind of in a war, right? In this digital age when it comes to getting these artists paid. It starts job to provide the ammo. A day is right around the corner and is already upon us when playlists are curated by the name of the engineer, by an individual performer or bass player, or even by the location. Because our algorithm can be trained to show the relationships between any conceivable data point, the possibilities of playlisting are limitless. Isn't that fun to think about? I'm not overstating when I say that metadata is quite literally the lifeblood of music. For it is metadata, again, accurate metadata that assures attribution, curation, and perhaps most importantly, payment. Pedro Dominguez, in his book, The Master Algorithm, which talks about the future impact of machine learning upon our society, points out that any digital technology is only as good as the data that serves it. And music is no exception. Dart's job is to make sure that those technologies, both today and in the future, get perfect data. Tom Truitt, uh, whom you know, uh, was kind enough to ask me to speak tonight, told me that I have to talk about myself. Those of you that know me know that I hate that. It's my least favorite thing in the world to do, but I told him I would, so here we go. Uh, I was born and raised here in Nashville, Music City. Like a lot of Nashvillians, I was involved in music at an early age. While on tour, I decided to drop into the MIT Media Lab. There, I met a brilliant guy named Tristan Yahan. Tristan showed me an amazing metadata project that he was working on, literally blew my mind, that took the sounds of one song, took those sounds, and played another song. I decided then and there that that's what I wanted to do. That project that Tristan was working on eventually became a metadata company called the Echo Nest, which was later acquired by Spotify. Anywho, at the end of that tour, I enrolled in a classical composition program, in part because Tristan's undergrad was composition. I, too, loved avant-garde classical music. After graduating, I went to work for a fruit company. <laughs> and they were dead set on changing the world. An eight-year stint at Apple was the best education I could have received. The only thing that could have taken me away from Apple did. I was offered a, offered a job marrying my two passions, classical and technology, at Noxos. And then, I did what any crazy person would do. I left Noxos to start a record label, a classical record label. And then after going through the wonderful but grueling Project Music Accelerator, we launched what Billboard called TuneCore for Classical. It is by solving the hardest metadata problem first in classical music, automating in seconds that which has historically taken teams of musicologists, kind of like these, <laughs> weeks to create that has enabled us to do what I'm about to show you. So we hear about metadata being a problem in music all the time, right? If we're in the music industry, we experience it when we're trying to get creators paid across hundreds of billions of microtransactions known as streaming. If you're counting all content, it's actually in the trillions. That's insane. It's actually unfathomable. As a consumer, we experience it every day as well in discovery and curation and recommendation. 
But have you tried asking Alexa, Google Home, or Siri that you want to hear Beethoven's Third by Herbert von Karajan? Uh, good luck. Uh, or even the top hits of 1967? That's metadata. Metadata drives that. So the complexity attributed to the classic Gigo monster of garbage in equals garbage out is magnified exponentially when it comes to music. For years, as an industry, we've been saying, let's all just agree on a universal standard. That would help the problem. But good luck getting 30,000 people to agree on anything, let alone companies. Actually, I think we do agree on one thing, as we've seen tonight, that creators deserve to be paid. And that is at the core of DART. Because <laughs> we're all creators ourselves. Yay. So instead of waiting for us all to finally agree and it then actually adhere to a universal standard, we ask a different question. Can we use technology to learn from the various standards that are already in place, accurately match those standards, and account for any changes and updates in a dynamic fashion? And that is DART. Not too many people have heard this, but it's an acronym. It's really cheesy, but it's a digital assets and repository tracking system. So let's dig in. I don't know if you can read that. It looks kind of small. But uh, here are some examples of what our clients have sent us. And then we'll look at the output that happens when it runs and hits the database. Uh, so uh, here we received um, album, uh, release, uh, the title of the track, and then the artist. Now, keep in mind, the way the artists get paid are from, if you're a recording artist, you get paid from an ISRC code. If you're a songwriter, you get paid uh, based on an ISWC code. Uh, if you're an individual contributor, like a publisher or a writer, um, the IPI is important. And so what our algorithm is able to return is that information and then some. We actually provide a lot more data than this. This is what this client was looking for. And uh, here's another one. Uh, Lucas Graham, if you can read that, just played the Ryman. Um, and here is what we returned uh, from that. Lots of writers on a lot of these new songs that are coming out. Um, and then uh, here's a, uh, a fun song. You know that one. Uh, it's good. Uh, David Bowie. And, you know, it's amazing. You would think you would be able to know who to pay with David Bowie, right? Um, but you actually need this data, and you need it quickly because these trillions of streams are happening in real time. Um, kind of bringing it full circle, here's some of the work we're doing with classical. I know it's hard to see, but basically there's a bunch of stuff on the left that's all wrong. And then what's on the right uh, is, uh, is what we return. <laughs> Thank you, Nardi. Um, so th this particular uh, opera had artists on every single track. Like, but these are the artists on the left that appeared on the album, not every track. If you submit that to John Marks and Spotify or Apple, they're going to reject it, right? So you, you want to put who is actually performing on that track. Uh, and so that's what's on the far right corner, uh, the far right column. And then um, if you look on the left, there's some inconsistencies in the track titles. Uh, the work number is not provided, and our algorithm is able to match and pull that back. And then as we look at playlisting, you know, even with very popular songs like Rihanna, uh, Diamonds by Rihanna, um, you know, the ISRC code is a code for an individual recording, right? And so if there's a remix, it should have a different ISRC. But you can see that it does not. And so we're able to basically audit as well and show those inconsistencies and make it so that people can do the right thing and get people paid. Uh, so, uh, according to this clock, I've got 38 seconds to do a live demo, um, so uh, I'll try to do that real fast. Tom, is there time? Cool. All right. Sweet. Um, so, let's find the flux capacitor. Try to make it bigger so you can see. And we have a track here, Save the Clock, or a file here, Save the Clock Tower. 
is the name of that file. And you can see, I don't know if you can see, but that's just artist name and song title. So we're going to upload that. And it's going to hit the database here and pull back that query if we are connected to the internet. Excellent. So we've got the artist and song title. Hit go. Yay. Excellent. So it pulls the top 10. We can see we have a lot more than artist and song title. And then for those technically savvy, here's a full common delimited file that you'll use to ingest into your system of all of that. <laughs> cool. And uh, guys, thank you. Appreciate it.